Samsung GHS 83. GHS 83. The word of feed in my heart. The word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path always to guide, to, to save me from sin and show me the heavenly way. Forever, O Lord, is thy word established and fixed on high. Thy faithfulness unto all men abideth forever near. At morning, at noon, at night, I ever will give thee praise. For thou art my portion, O Lord, and shall be true all my days. Through him whom the world hath foretold, the Savior and the morning star, salvation and peace have been brought to those who have strayed apart. The world hath hid in my heart, that I may not sin against thee, that I may not sin that I may not sin thy word have I heed in my heart.
relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. Genesis, chapter 8, chapter 8. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand, and took her, and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass, in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living, as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. Chapter 9 And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. 
and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Deeper Life Bible Church Choir Ministrations from nations across the world.
burden seems so heavy My troubles sometimes many And there are times I feel hope is gone But in my darkest heart He's my strong and my sister And Jesus gives me strength to carry on I'm a 
غيرك ولا هعبد غيرك حاضر في حياتي وايامي ومالي نعبيرك عايش في خيرك ولا هعبد غيرك حاضر في حياتي President of Turkish Baptist Conference and the Chairman of Christian Association of Nigeria, Turkish State. I have the honor to invite all churches, all believers, to the global crusade that is being organized by our beloved father, the pastor Dr. W. F. Kumuyi, who by the special grace of God is coming to Ekiti. The crusade is taking off between December 22nd to 27th. This year, God is set to visit the land, and we are glad to receive this man of God in the land. The crusade is tagged Great Transformation for Total Triumph, which is going to be held in the Deeper Life Bible Church Camp Grand, Ajiba Midele, Adoi Kere Road, in Adoi Kiti. The crusade is going to be aired all over the world, because as it's going on in the state, Several people from all over the world will be participating in this crusade. God bless you as to come for total transformation, for deliverance, for healing, and for the salvation of your soul. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to be part of this crusade. God bless you as to come. Joy in the city, joy in your life, joy in your family, and joy everywhere in Jesus' name. It's a prophecy specifically for you in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria. The Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth. Young adults and professionals. Titled recharge to excel december 27 2022 at all 600 hours gmt all broadcasts live on satellite radio television and all our social media platform pastor dr w f kumoyi says you'll praise god you'll give your testimony and more as excellent worship comes from the usa with jonathan white our guest music minister gck the gospel to every creature. Change of mind concerning your past, wrong belief. It's a change of direction from the past life. And when we think about and we're talking about repentance, it includes sorrow for sin. Sorrow for sin, that is, you now realize this is wrong. I've been walking against God. I've been talking against God. I've been living against God. And because of that, you have sorrow for sin, which is associated with that repentance. It is such sorrow that causes you to hate the sins of your past life. Because of the sorrow for sin you have, you hate the sins of your past life. It leads to confession. Confession of the sin and so they're turning away with all your heart. Now, mere confession is not repentance. Mere confession without hatred for sin is not genuine repentance. There are people that have regrets. That's not repentance. 
There are people that have remorse. That's not repentance. There are people that will just open their mouth and confess, we've done this, we've done this. Oh, would they might even say we're sorry. But that's not real repentance. You see, there are people like that. They would say they have sinned. And yet, oh God, can I still do it? Will you permit me? I don't hate that sin. I don't reject that sin. I'm not going, how, what, how can I live without that wrong pleasure, that fleshly pleasure? There's no repentance there. If you are running from judgment, if you want to escape judgment, if you flee from the wrath to come, if you are coming because you mean business, therefore bring forth fruits, meat, suitable for repentance. You have to take off the dirty clothes before you put on the new clothes. You have to take off the wrong ideas before you bring in sound doctrine. A repentant person doesn't tempt the Lord. A repentant person will not come and tempt preachers. They are their erroneous doctrine about how to please God. And those things are still there. I will say if you want to have Jesus Christ, Jesus is love. Jesus is power. Jesus is a miracle worker. Jesus can do all things. Raise up your hand. They raise up their hands. Nothing touches their ideas, their opinions, and their false doctrine, and the false way they are going. And then they go back, and they go back to the same error, to the same ideology, to the same tradition. There's no repentance there. There's no salvation there. Repentance is turning. Repentance is turning away. You turn away your mind from the abominations. You turn away your desires from those abominations. You turn away your affection from those abominations. You turn away your heart completely from all those abominations. Being born into the church does not guarantee salvation. Because that would mean like we have Abraham as our father. We have coordinator as our father. And we have overseer as our father. And then just because we have Abraham as our father, we we'll see that's all. My father has done everything, consecrated everything. My father is great in this, our church. If anybody gets to heaven, of course all we as children must get to heaven. It doesn't work that way. That's why it says, don't think that because you have Abraham as your father, therefore you're going to heaven. The axe is laid on the root of every tree. And any tree that does not bring forth good fruit will be cut down and they will be cast into the fire. The Lord is not willing that the children of pagans will go to hell. Children of Christians will go to hell. He's not willing that anyone will perish. And I pray that the fruit of repentance will be visible in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. The Lord has taught us again today, and He wants us to be effective ministers of the gospel, preachers of the gospel. And He wants this good thing that we have known uh, to go to all the people. And your converse and the people we are talking to, they must, they must, they must have this genuine experience, repentance, reconciliation with God, Righteousness. Praise the Lord. If you are still there and you are awake, I said, Praise the Lord. I pray the love of God will flow through every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because you brought us together so you can put your love in every heart and feel every heart with your love. We're asking, Lord, tonight that you make us to understand your word. And this love will enrich every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. I will pray, Lord, that as we experience more of your love, that you cleanse us, you purge us, you purify us, and your love flowing through us will bring fruit in our community in Jesus' name. We'll bear fruit. We'll bear more fruit will be a much fruit, manifold fruit in the kingdom in Jesus' name. You saw us to be a blessing to everyone in our communities. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to John chapter 15, reading from verse 7. 
If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what she will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that she bear much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified. You are a child of God. You've come to know the Lord. You are born again. You are converted. You are a new creature in Christ. Here is how to glorify the Father. In everything you do, everywhere you go, and whichever way you live, it says is to bring forth fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that she bear fruit. Not only that, that will bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and I abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. You'll have the joy of the Lord. You know, once we are born again, the joy of the Lord comes in our hearts. It says, happy day, happy day, when you washed my sins away. And when that happy day comes to your life, what a change, what a transformation. And the joy of the Lord comes to you. Then it says, the joy will not remain stagnant, will not remain at the same level. And your joy will be increasing. It will be full in Jesus' name. Look at that verse 11 again. These things have I spoken unto you so that my joy might remain in you. That is, whatever circumstance you find yourself, whatever situation you might find yourself, you are a child of God, you are connected with the Lord, remaining with the Lord, the joy of the Lord will abide. And then it says that your joy might be full. In your family, your joy will be full. Personal life, your joy will be full. And as you walk the Christian life and live the Christian life, your joy will be full in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that she love one another as I have loved you. Greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye yeah, are my friends. Tell me. If you do whatsoever, I command you. It says you cannot just say, I'm a friend of Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. I have fellowship with Christ without being obedient to his word. And so he says, here is the evidence. Here is the proof. Here is the thing that shows that you really love God and that you're a friend of Christ. Ye are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Then he says in verse 16, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit. That's the purpose of the kingdom. That's the purpose you came. That's the purpose you were born again. That's the purpose he called you. That's the purpose he converted you. That's the reason why he brought you into the kingdom. And that's the reason why he has chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Your fruit will abide. You know, see, I went converse, but they never, they never come into the church. They will come. A new day, a new era, a new dispensation, those converts will come, they will abide in Jesus' name. And then it says that whatsoever, whatsoever you ask in my name, you ask the Father in my name, that he may give each you. Those are the verses we are looking at today. And you will see that uh, the word fruit comes over and over and over again. As we look at God's universal creation, fruitfulness is his unchanging demand, unchanging desire. The whole creation was made to be fruitful. And in the natural, he wants us fruitful. 
in the spiritual, he wants us fruitful. And as you look at it from the very beginning of the Bible, you'll see that this is the demand of God and this is the desire of the Lord. Tonight, I'm talking to you on God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. But look at him from the beginning of your Bible. We're reading from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. So you see the demand of God and you see the desire of God. He wants you fruitful. He wants me fruitful. He wants every one of us fruitful. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill up the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You see from the opening chapter of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1, he wants you fruitful. He desires that you be fruitful and he, de he demands that you be fruitful. Chapter 9 verse 7. In chapter 9 verse 7, it says, and you, is now particular because this is now after the flood, and you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. There can be no doubt in anybody's heart who knows the Bible, who reads the Bible, that God demands fruitfulness. God desires fruitfulness. We're looking at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 6. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, look at what it says here. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. All the time, all the time. From the opening chapter of Genesis, it says, fruitfulness is the demand and fruitfulness is his desire i will make thee fruitful exceedingly fruitful and i will make nations of thee and kings shall come of thee we're coming to chapter 35 of genesis genesis chapter 35 and we're looking at verse 11 in verse 11 it says and god said unto him unto jacob now i am god almighty be fruitful and multiply. There's no doubt in your heart now that when he calls anyone, he wants that one fruitful. As he calls you into the kingdom, he wants you fruitful. God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins and then we're going to the bible now old testament we're looking at someone in someone we're looking at a verse three someone verse three here now he's talking about it's not talking about the family now he's talking about your moral life it's talking about your righteous life. It's talking about the fact that you know the Lord and you're separated from the world and is expecting some kind of fruit in your life. Look at Psalm 1 verse 3. And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His fruit, his fruit, the fruit of his life and the fruit of his character, and the fruit of his connection with the Lord, and his leave also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, what will happen? You will prosper in Jesus' name. Look at uh, Psalm 128, Psalm 128, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. It says in verse 3, thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the side of thine house. I thought somebody there married will say, Amen. Yeah. Thy children like holy plants round about thy table. Behold that thou shalt the man be blessed that fearest the Lord. And so you see the, the, the reason why we're talking about a fruitfulness fruitfulness and more fruitfulness and much fruitfulness in proverbs it tells us in chapter 11 proverbs chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 13 
Proverbs chapter 11, we're looking at verse 30. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. It said, we started with a family. It started with natural fruit, bearing fruit naturally. But now he's talking about spiritual fruit. And he's talking about the righteous one. And he says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls, everybody tell me. It's wise that Jesus, you are now a child of God. You have been won to the kingdom of God yourself. And now you become wise and it is that wisdom, the wisdom of the spirit and the wisdom of the scriptures and the wisdom that you gain as you study the word of God from week after week, that that wisdom now leads you to win souls into the kingdom. Now the converted believer, the believer is a converted person. The believer is a conditioned person, and the believer is a commissioned person, and is converted, is conditioned, and is to is commissioned to bear fruit. Whatever he does, whatever he becomes in life, fruitfulness in the kingdom is God's measure of a purposeful life, if God's measure of a profitable life, and God's measure of a pleasing life. When somebody says, I'm, I praise the Lord, I'm born again. I thank the Lord, I'm converted. And then the word of God is reconditioning you. And is making you face the right direction. That in life now, you know that you're living for something. A purposeful believer. A practical believer. And a profitable believer, pleasing the Lord. There's something you're going to find in your life. And it is fruitfulness. We're coming to the New Testament now. And we're starting from the opening a book of uh, Matthew, which is uh, the first uh, book of the New Testament. And you will see, just like in the Old Testament, it demands fruit. And God desires fruit the same way he desires fruit today. And he demands fruit today. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Look at verse 8. Bring forth therefore. Therefore, if you are coming out of, uh, you know, the, the darkness of the world and the sins of the world, and you're coming to the Lord so that your sins will be forgiven, your life will be transformed, he says, therefore, bring forth fruits, plural, fruits, meat for repentance. Look at verse 10 there. In verse 10, and now also the access laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not a good fruit is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. You see the desire of God. He wants fruitfulness. You will bear fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not good, for not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We're looking at Mark chapter 4, verse 20. In Mark chapter 4, verse 20, he's still telling us the desire of God and the demand of God. He wants fruitfulness. You will bear fruit. And look at this in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word. You see that? You hear the word, your life has not been transformed. You hear the word, and you are washed, and you are cleansed. You hear the word, and then you become fruitful. Look at this in verse 20. It says, they hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth, tell me, fruit some tell me 30 fold some 60 fold and some a hundred fold did you see the grading there number one 30 fold bearing fruit number two 60 fold is bearing more fruit and then uh, number three a hundred fold is bearing much fruit and uh, we look at um, uh, luke chapter 13 in Luke chapter 13, again, once again, uh, it's still reminding us that the essential thing of the Christian life is bearing fruit. You cannot just say, I'm born again, I'm converted, I'm a child of God, I'm a member of the body of Christ. And then we'll say, where is your fruit? I'll say, am I supposed to bear fruit? 
Yes, you're supposed to bear fruit. In fact, the, the more you go on in the Lord, you bear more fruit, and then you bear much fruit. We're looking at Mark chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 6. He spake also this parable a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon. That's what he's seeking for in your life, that's what he's looking for in every life. But he found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none cut it down, while cumbereth it the ground. And his answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dunk it, and if it bear fruit, well. You see that? That's what he's looking for. If it bears fruit, that will be good. If not, then, uh, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And then we come to Romans chapter 6, the fruit were to bear. What he calls fruit, when he says we should be bringing forth fruit, and when it says, you will be bringing forth fruit, you'll bring forth fruit. Look at Romans chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Now, being made free from sin, born again people, children of God, and they're living the victorious life and the righteous life, it says, now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have, tell me, your fruit unto what? Unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. It shows you very clearly the demand of God as well as the desire of the Lord. He wants fruitfulness. Without fruits, our lives, our existence is not well pleasing to God. Now, when he's talking about fruit, what kind of fruit is he talking about? Number one is the fruit of repentance. Somebody has turned away from sin, and then he comes to know the Lord, is believed of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's a change of life, a change of heart, a change of direction. Number one, there's the fruit of repentance. Number two, there's the fruit of regeneration. Regeneration. That is, there is a change in the heart, there's a change in the life, there's a change in the character that regeneration will bring fruit number three is the fruit of restoration somebody has made a backslider and is being like the prodigal son far away from the lord but he said i'll go back to my father i will say my father i have sinned against you and against heaven i'm no more worthy to be called thy son make me one of the servants and then he came home and the father received him is restored into the family of god and when there is that reconciliation and restoration there must be fruit the fruit of restoration the fruit of reconciliation number four it is the fruit of righteousness that somebody says now i am redeemed and the lord has turned my life around if that life has been turned around there's righteousness and what we see there we're going to see the fruit of holiness the fruit of righteousness in that person's life. And then number five, the fruit of revelation. You know, if somebody, before you came to the Lord, you were in darkness. You didn't know anything. And now you came to know the Lord. And the scripture has been expounded to you. You are being taught every time. I see that. I see that. I didn't know that before. Now I know that. Now I know about conversion. And now I, I know about salvation. Now I know about sanctification. Now I know about the kingdom of God. That revelation that comes to you must be a fruit. The more you know in the Lord, the more you have in the Lord, the more you are going to bear fruit. The fruit of revelation. Number six, the fruit of reunion. You see, when you are united with Christ, he is the husband and you are the bride. He is the bridegroom 
and you are the bride, that reunion as you are united with the Lord, there is fruit bearing and it is the fruit of reunion. There's the fruit of renewal. Number seven, you see your life is renewed and as your life is renewed, there's revival in your life and you are so, you are so excited, you are serving the Lord now, that renewal, that revival will bring fruit in your life and now the more you look into Christ and you look at his face, the more you look like him. It says we shall see him and we shall be like him. There's a fruit of resemblance. You resemble the Lord. You're looking like the Lord. You are talking like the Lord. You learn from the Lord. You lean upon the Lord. And because of that resemblance to Christ, that is a bearing fruit in your life. And then number nine, there's a fruit of reproduction. The fruit of reproduction. And Christ Jesus said, he that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do. And greater works than this shall do because I go to the Father. When you are doing the works of Christ, you are living like Christ, you are evangelizing like Christ, you are healing like Christ, you are doing things like Christ would have done. If Christ were in your situation today, then you are bearing the fruit of reproduction by Christ, the fruit of reproduction through Christ, and the fruit of reproduction in Christ for Christ. And so we understand what the Lord is looking for. He demands fruit. You will bear fruit. He desires fruit, you'll be a fruit. And when the fruit is in your life, everybody will see that there's a change that has taken place in your life. As I said tonight, we're considering God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. Three things we're looking at as we study the passage today from John chapter 15. Number one, the price of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. The price, the price we're paying. The things we have to do. The denial we have to go through and the faith we have to go through and everything we have to do, the price we have to pay, the price of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. Number two, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. I'm a friend of Christ. There's a proof for that. I'm in fellowship with Christ. There's a proof for that. I'm, co I'm connected with the Lord. I'm abiding in the Lord. There's a proof for that. You must show that this is real. And it is not just talk of mouth. Point number two, then the proof of true fellowship with Christ. Number three, the privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. The trustworthy friends of Christ. The privilege such people have. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one over there. <laughs> Wonderful church. The prize of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. We're coming to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm going to read from verse 7 all through to verse 10. So you'll see what the Lord is saying. He says, if he abides in me, and uh, my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. It says, Herein is my Father glorified, that she bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. It says, you cannot just say, I'm a disciple of Christ, and then you're fruitless. I'm a disciple of Christ, and you are empty. I'm a disciple of Christ, and there is no profit of you in the kingdom, and you're not contributing anything to the kingdom of God, as you say that you are a child of God. It says, herein is my Father glorified, that you in particular bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples that the father has loved me even so have I also loved you it says continue ye in my love and it says if ye keep my commandments ye abide in my love even as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love and let's back up to verse 4 in verse 4 it says abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. No more can ye except he abide in me. It's saying the price will pay. 
the things we do if we're going to bear fruit is that we continue in Christ we abide in Christ we're embedded in Christ and we are totally in Christ look at verse 5 I am the vine and ye are the branches he that abides in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing he wants us to bear fruit you'll bear fruit in Jesus name Let, let's come to that verse 10 again if ye keep my commandments ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love What's the price the Lord is telling us we have to pay if we're going to bear fruit? That's the price of abiding in Christ. Temptation will come and try to get you out of Christ. Say, no, 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 no. I'm going to remain in Christ. Somebody there said, I'm going to remain in Christ. Yes. Trials, challenges, and pressures, oppression, whatever may come. And then people might even threaten you if you remain a Christian. And you know, the secret of bearing fruit is that you abide, is that you remain. And you're going to remain in Jesus' name. Uh, look, look at first John and look at the importance of abiding, abiding in Christ. We're looking at first John chapter 2, verse uh, first John chapter 2, and here we're looking at uh, verse 6. First John chapter 2, verse 6. It says, He that says he abideth in him or himself, also so to walk, even as he walked. It says, if we're abiding in Christ, here is what's going to happen. You live like Christ. You talk like Christ, you behave like Christ. You see, in any situation and in, at any crossroad, in your office, in the home, anywhere, what would Christ do? What will Christ do? The man who is abiding in Christ, the woman who is abiding in Christ, will do what Christ would have done if Christ were in that same situation. Look at that verse 6 again. He that says, He abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk. Even as he walked, look at verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. It says that if we love the Lord, if we abide in the Lord, that we're going to show that love by acting in the light and living in the light and there'll be no occasion of stumbling in your own life look at verse 14 in verse 14 i have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning i've written unto you young men because ye are strong praise god you are strong somebody there i am strong and the word of God abides in you. You see that? That's how to bear fruit. The word of God abides in you. It's not that the word of God is coming in through one ear and then going out through the other ear. It's not that we're hearing the word of God like on Monday and then at the, at, in the evening after the Bible study, we can't even remember what we have heard. And then on Tuesday, we can't apply what we have heard. But we hear the word, we take in the word, we believe leave the word, we digest the word and we live by the word and then in our offices anywhere we go, they will know that the word of God has come into us and abiding in us and ye have overcome the wicked one. Yeah. Any overcomer in the house? Ye have overcome the wicked one. And it is by the word of God abiding in us that we actually overcome. And then it goes on to say in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the loss thereof but he that doeth the will of God tell me abideth forever those who come out of the world they come out of the pollutions of the world and they abide in the word of God and the word of God is abiding in them and they live according to the word of God it says those are the people that are going to abide forever the, the, the price will pay so that we can bear fruit let me show you this important verse in Isaiah chapter 37 
Isaiah chapter 37, and I'm reading from verse, uh, reading from verse 31. Isaiah chapter 30, chapter 37, and uh, verse, uh, tell me the verse 31. Look at this. It says, uh, have you opened your Bible? I see some people still opening. I'm not going to wait for you because I have a lot of verses to read today. Look at it. Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 31. It says, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downwards and bear fruit upward. You see that? There's a connection there. It's like a tree. And the more the root will sink into the ground, the more the branches will shoot up and then there'll be fruit on the branches. It's telling us that you as a child of God, as you go deeper in, the, in your root, in the foundation, and you go into Christ and deeper into the scripture and deeper into the love of God and deeper into the ocean of his uh, promises and and everything he has provided for you, the deeper you go downward, then the higher you go upwards. Look at that verse again. It says, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and then bear fruit upward. You will bear fruit in Jesus' name. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 17, and we're reading here from verse 7, Blessed is the man. Looks like this one is talking about me. I said he's talking about me. It says, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. The person who is trusting the Lord, who is believing the Lord and he says whatever temptation comes I will overcome whatever challenges come I will overcome whatever enemies do I will overcome they will not stop my journey halfway they will not discourage me I will not backslide I'm going to trust in the Lord he saved me he's going to sustain me is sustaining me, is going to sanctify me. He has sanctified me, is going to baptize me and fill me with the Holy Ghost. He's always trusting in the Lord. And that face in the Lord, look at what it generates in verse 8. It shall be like a tree planted by the waters. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river. And then it says, it shall not see heat when the heat cometh but her leaf shall be green. Yeah. I'm going to make it personal. My, my leaf shall be green. Yeah. And shall not, it says, and shall not be careful, shall not be anxious in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You'll keep on yielding fruit. Yeah. Fruit of righteousness, you'll keep on yielding. Of regeneration, you yield in Jesus' name. Of total restoration, reconciliation, you yield in Jesus' name. Fruit of revival. Days of revival are coming our church, and you'll be yielding fruits of revival, renewal, in Jesus' name. And you'll be yielding the fruit of revelation. Look at all the revelations the Lord is giving us. And it's revealing the truth in depth unto us every time. And it says, there's the fruit of uh, this revelation. It will be seen in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to, we're coming to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 24. John chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 24. The fruit we bear has a price. There's a price to pay and you want to pay the price to make sure that you are bearing fruit and your, and your fruit yielding uh, ability will not cease in Jesus name. We're looking at John chapter 12 verse 24. It says verily verily I say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone. You know if you so cherish your life, you preserve your life you protect your life, you can't go out, you can't touch other people, you can't go into your community, you can't evangelize, you can't do anything. It says, if you love your life like that, 
You'll be alone. It says, except that corn of wheat will fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, that is plant it. That is, give it to the soil. That is, throw it, throw your life to be of benefit to other people. That's what it means by sin. If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You'll bring forth much fruit. Yeah. He that loveth his life, verse 25, shall lose it. But, and he that hateth his life, in this war shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, I will serve the Lord. I said I will serve the Lord. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We're coming to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 2. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. And this passage is talking about uh, the fact that we are married to Christ. If you're a child of God, we're connected with Christ. We're married unto Christ. And we're wedded Christ. And because he is not barren, there's nothing wrong with him. If there's any fruitlessness, if there's any barrenness, the fault will be on our side. Because Jesus Christ is complete. Look at it now. Romans chapter 7 verse 2. For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from that law, from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. And if, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more an adulteress, though she be married to another man. See the spiritual implication, application, wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Him who is raised from the dead. Who is that? Jesus Christ. We're married to him now. You're converted. You're married to Christ. You're born again. You're married to Christ. You're reconciled by the blood of the Lamb, by the death, substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. You're married to Christ. Look at the result that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You see that? That's the purpose of that union with Christ. Look at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Verse 6, it says, but now. Somebody shout, but now. But now. That's the dividing line. That's the conversion right there. That's the regeneration right there. That's the change, the transformation that has come. Because it says, here is the way we were. We were outside in darkness. We were fruitless. And we didn't have the nature of God inside us. And then we repented. And then we believed not the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there is a reunion with the Lord. And it says, but now we're delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Amen. That means the change has really taken place and then we are bearing fruit. What kind of fruit are we bearing? We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. The fruit that we bear now. Now that we're children of God, now that we're born again, and now that we know the Lord, and the grace of God has come into our lives, look at the fruit we bear. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, they who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws. That's the price we pay. Christ paid the full price to save us. 
Christ has paid the full price to sanctify us. Christ has paid the full price to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and to empower us and to equip us and to prepare us for fruitfulness. And now it's your turn now. It's my turn now. It's our turn now that we must also pay the necessary price in preparing ourselves for fruitfulness. What kind of price do we pay? Number one, we must be willing and desirous. It's not just that you know somebody is not interested in bearing fruit. It cannot bear fruit. There must be that willingness and desire. Number two, we must abide and consecrate. We abide in the Lord and we consecrate our lives and we say, Lord, I want to bear fruit and I want the fruit to be evident in my life. Number three, we also want to receive and retain the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision. Paul the apostle said, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And when you are born again, as a real child of God, you are hearing about evangelism, evangelism, you receive that, you accept that, and you understand, you are receiving and retaining the heavenly vision. Not only that, you are purged to be prepared to be a fruit and you are dead to the world and alive unto God you are dead to the world and alive to God anything coming from the world that will sap your spiritual energy anything coming from the world that will destroy your usefulness and fruitfulness you are dead to them not only that you have and you keep the mind of Christ let this mind be you which was also in Christ and as you keep that mind of Christ and you're thinking what Christ will think and you're looking at what Christ will look at and you're going where Christ will go and you're doing what Christ Christ will do, thank God, you are going to be a fruit. And then you'll be crucified and fully identified with Christ. Crucified and fully identified with Christ. You'll be able to testify like Paul the Apostle. You'll say, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And this is not something that is imposed on you. You present yourself to Christ. You identify fully and completely with Christ. I'm willing to pay the price. Whatever it will take, I'm willing to do so that I will be fruitful. You'll be fruitful. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray to be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two now. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. And what the Lord is telling us is that if we say we're in fellowship with Christ, there's a proof for that. It's not just an empty testimony. Somebody says, I'm in Christ. Anybody can say that. Where is the proof? That's what the Lord is looking for. Point number two then, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. We're coming to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we're reading from verse 11. John chapter 15, from verse 11. It says, these things I have spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. These things I've spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you. There's the joy of salvation. There is a joy of fruit bearing. You see, the 70 returned with joy. And he said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And they rejoice because they were bearing fruit. Number one, because of salvation, they rejoice. Number two, because of service, they rejoice. And he said, as they continue in that experience of salvation, and then they're growing in that experience of salvation, it says their joy will be getting higher and higher, and eventually your joy will be full. This is my commandment, that she love one another as I have loved you. And then it says, greater love has no man than this, that a man should uh, lay down his life for his friends. Look at this in verse 14. Yeah, my friends. Yeah, my friends. If, tell me. Say that again. 
Yeah, my friends, if you do, if you do whatsoever, I command you. It says there is a proof. If you really love the Lord, there is a proof. And if you don't love the Lord, when you know people around you can tell because of the kind of life you live. Let me show you Deuteronomy chapter thirteen. Deuteronomy chapter thirteen. We're looking at verse. We're looking at it from verse one. It says the proof of our love for God and the proof of our fellowship with God is that we're obedient to the word of the Lord. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams uh, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that sign, the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. Nobody will make you backslide. Yeah. Or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God, tell me the word, proves you. The Lord your God is proving you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. When the temptation comes like that, when somebody is trying to draw you away like that, when somebody is trying to make you live contrary to the word of God you are hearing, the Lord wants to know whether you will abide in the word or not. He's proving you. And it says in verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. You will serve the Lord and you will cleave unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. And look at chapter 4, chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. Mark this, your Bible is a very important verse. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I, which I command you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish or subtract aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Because, you know, if ye keep my commandments, then are ye my friend. If you keep the commandments of God, then are you the friend of Christ? It says you will not subtract, you will not add to that word. Look at that same chapter and we're looking at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. And that's the evidence that we really know the Lord and we love the Lord and we are connected with the Lord and we are being saved and regenerated, transformed by the Lord. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord your God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. When it says, the Lord shall circumcise thine heart. That's another word for sanctification. Circumcision not of the flesh, but of the heart. It circumcises your heart. And that's sanctification. And when that sanctification has taken place, look at what will follow. It says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and you will live, you will live in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 8, verse 8. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord your God and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. So that's the proof that you are circumcised. Somebody says, I'm circumcised. I'm sanctified. And then after that sanctification, we cannot see a better life. We cannot see a richer life. We cannot see a life that is going deep into the obedience of the word of God. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep the commandments of of the Lord and his statutes which are written in this book of the Lord and if thou shalt if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul 
That's the evidence of that spiritual, um, spiritual circumcision and sanctification. Look at uh, verse 16 here. In verse 16, it says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Very clearly, then he expects that if we say we're saved, if we say we're children of God, if we say we have any connection with the Lord, redemptive connection, transformational connection, it says you must be obedient to the word of the Lord. If you keep my commandments, then are you my friends. Let's come to Psalm 119, Psalm 119. I'm reading here from verse 60. Psalm 119, verse 60. Keeping the commandments of God, that's the evidence, and that is the proof we know the Lord. That is the proof we love the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 16. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I'm so excited, and I desire to please the Lord. And it says, I made haste, I delayed not to keep the commandments of the Lord. Look at 115. That is verse 115. In verse 115, it said, Depart from me, ye evil doers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. He is my God. He is my Father. He is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. And I've made up my mind. There's no other commandment to keep. It's the commandment of the Lord. And all those who are backsliding or they are sinners and they want to influence you, you say, Depart from me because I've made up my mind I'm going to keep the commandment of the Lord in fact actually Ecclesiastes tells us Ecclesiastes chapter 12 I'm looking at verse 13 it says uh, this is the conclusion of the whole matter this is the evidence that you, are, you really know the Lord and this is what God is going to look at on the final day it is not that you know I go to church it's not like I have a Christian name it's not like I was baptized in what all those things are good but the final scene the evidence and the proof that will belong to the lord look at what god is going to look at ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 let us hear the conclusion the conclusion of the whole matter let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and do what keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man this is why we're here this is why we're studying the Bible. This is why we're born again. This is why the grace of God has come into our lives. This is why the Lord is teaching us in the scriptures by spirit so that we'll keep the word of God. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret sin, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I pray you'll keep the commandments of God. We're coming to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. John chapter 14, reading from verse 15, it says, in chapter 14, verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, keep my commandments. The proof of loving Christ is living for him. The proof of loving Christ is living as he has commanded. The proof of loving Christ is living as he lived, living like he would live today if he were here and if he were confronted with a situation or a circumstances. Can anyone say, I love God, I love Christ without listening to him? Somebody says, oh, I love the Lord, I love the Lord with all my heart. I love him so much. The number one thing, if you really love him, you will listen to him. Can anybody say, I love God, I love Christ without learning of him? 
It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And then it says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Can you say you love the Lord? Number one, without listening to him. Number two, without learning of him. Number three, without living only for him. You're not living for yourself. You're not living for the world. You're not living for society. Only living for him. Number four, can you say you love the Lord without laboring for him? You see, his work is there to be done and the people are not saved and the field is not harvested and the, you know termites are coming in, and all the wild animals are coming in and the false prophets are coming in and taking the people away into darkness into false doctrine and you are there and you say I love the Lord can you say you love the Lord without laboring for him number five can you say you love the Lord without leaving the world behind you and saying the things that were given to me everything I drop everything I leave behind can you say you love the Lord without leaving the world behind you and losing everything for his glory and for his sake can you say you love the Lord without leading souls to him leading souls to him the lost are there. The sinners are there. The people are there and they're waiting for somebody to guide them and somebody to lead them into the kingdom. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Well, show it by the kind of life you live. Can you say you love the Lord without loving only what he loves and without loving only who he loves supremely? If you say you love the Savior, prove it by the life you live. If you say you love the Savior, prove it by the things you do. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the labor of love that you render. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the desires in your heart, the thoughts of your heart, the plan of your life. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by whose commandment you keep whose commandment you keep. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the total commitment you have unto him. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by submission to him in all things. Prove it. Prove it. You must prove it. Look at Deuteronomy chapters, chapter 8. Prove. Prove. Very important. You must prove it by what you do. Don't give empty testimony. I don't give a testimony that God is not packing up. You are going to prove your love for God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. And to prove thee. To know what was in thine heart, whether that would escape his commandments or no. The proof is very important. You say you love the Lord, there must be a proof, there must be an evidence. Second Corinthians chapter 8, the proof. Second Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 22. It says in Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22, And we have sent with him or them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent. We have often proved diligent. You see that? There's a proof. If we say we love the Lord, we know the Lord. If we say we're connected to the Lord, we're converted by the Lord, prove it. It says we have oftentimes proved him a diligent in many things. And now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 5. Chapter 13, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Prove your own selves. Prove your testimony and prove your confession and prove your dedication. You say, I love the Lord, prove it. I'm a friend of Christ, prove it. And born again, prove it by the life you live. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You will not be a reprobate. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 4. And let every man prove. His own work. 
I'm a minister, provide. I'm a soul winner, provide. I love the Lord, provide. I'm profitable in the kingdom, provide. I am fruitful, provide. I am faithful, provide. And let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. First Timothy chapter 3. In First Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. First Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 10. And let these also first be proved. Let these also first be proved. It's not enough for somebody to just say, I'm born again. Let these also first be proved. It's not enough for somebody to say, I've learned the word of God. I'm living by the word of God. I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm in fellowship with Christ. Let these also be first proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. We're coming back to John Gospel according to St. John. And we're looking at uh, this chapter 15. Chapter 15. we come to point number three now. The privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. The privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. I'm going to back up to verse 13. Look at it from verse 13 now. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for tell me his friends his friends you know sometimes uh, we have used the word believers believers but there's something more sometimes we say i'm a child of god there's something more sometimes we say i'm a convert there's something more sometimes we say i'm a sage there's something more he says he calls us friends he calls us friends he says uh, that a man lay down his life for his friends Ye are my friends. Look at that. Ye are my friends. He was talking to some disciples. Ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever, I command you. Look at verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, uh, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you, tell me, friends. The third time now, in uh, this uh, short passage, is calling the believer's friend. He says, I've called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Why did he say that? Because there's no friendship or fellowship between light and darkness. Because you are willing to quit darkness, leave darkness, come out of darkness and come into the light I have chosen you you have not chosen me I was watching you there's no fellowship there's no friendship between good and evil and if you wanted to keep to evil and remain in evil and perpetrate evil I wouldn't choose you but because you are willing to come out of evil and come into the goodness of the Lord into the grace of God I have you have not chosen me I have chosen you there's no friendship there's no fellowship between righteousness Righteousness and unrighteousness. If you are cleaving to your righteousness, if you are embracing your righteousness, if you are getting deeper and deeper in your unrighteousness, I wouldn't choose you to be a friend. But I've chosen you, you have not chosen me because I saw that you are willing to quit unrighteousness. You are willing to run away from righteousness and come into righteousness. There is no fellowship, there's no friendship between truth and error. If you were holding on to the tradition of uh, those uh, uh, people that didn't want the truth, you were holding on to error, I wouldn't want you to be a friend. But because you let the error and you ran away from the error and you repented from the error and you threw away the false doctrine and you came into the truth that's why I chose you there is no fellowship and there is no friendship between holiness and hypocrisy if you had remained like those Pharisees hypocritical and they were white on the outside but black on the inside if you didn't really choose uh, inward transparent holiness and you were hypocritical I would not have chosen you you have not chosen 
chosen me, but I have chosen you. There's no friendship and there's no fellowship between Christ and the Antichrist. If you made up your mind you are going to follow the Antichrist, someone opposed to Christ, a doctrine opposed to Christ, a lifestyle opposed to Christ, I wouldn't have chosen you, but I've chosen you now because of your choice that you are going to forsake everything false, everything evil, everything dirty, everything defiling, and you came to Christ. That's why I have chosen you, and I've chosen you for one reason, and ordained you that you should Go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit shall remain. And that your fruit shall abide. Your fruit will abide in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to understand that, uh, you know, the language Jesus Christ was using when he says, ye are my friends. The Heavenly Father used that language to start with. Let's look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 23. James chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 23. You'll see the, you know, the first person to be a friend of God. Uh, look at uh, James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was, uh, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and it was called, tell me, the friend of God, not before conversion, not when in idolatry, not when in darkness, but when he had the word of God and he repented and he believed in the Lord and then the Lord counted that for him as righteousness and then he became uh, the friend of God. And Christ is now saying, it's your turn. Like Abraham uh, was a friend of God the Father, you can be a friend of Jesus. Look at Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 41. And we're reading from verse 8. It says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, this is the Almighty God Himself talking, and Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of. Tell me, tell me. The seed of Abraham, my friend. God called him friend, and the Lord is calling you friend. Uh, uh, let's look at another man. We're looking at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, and we're reading from verse 11. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. It was possible for these ones who are reading about to become uh, the friend of God, and it is possible for you to be a friend of Jesus, a friend of the richest man in the whole universe. A friend of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. A friend of our Savior. A friend of the Healer. A friend of the Redeemer. A friend of the Deliverer. And it will deliver you every time in Jesus' name. Look at this. Look at this. Exodus chapter 33. And I'm reading from verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now to his friend, Moses too was a friend of God. And now for us to be a friend of Christ, a friend of God, what does it take? How do we position ourselves? What life do we live in the open and in the secret, anywhere and everywhere? Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. A friend loveth at all times. And if and a brother is born for adversity, when uh, in whatever situation you find yourself, you love him, you keep his commandments, and you walk according to his way. A friend loves at all times. Look at chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 24. Chapter 18 of Proverbs, verse 24. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. You, you say you're a friend of Christ and you want Christ to keep you as a friend, you must show yourself friendly. Show yourself loving. Show yourself loyal. So show yourself faithful. And then it says, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That is, you might have brothers and sisters on earth, but to stick close to Christ, closer to Christ than to anyone on earth, then you'll be a real friend of Jesus. I'm a friend of Jesus. 
Proverbs chapter 22. We're reading from verse 11. Proverbs chapter 22 from verse 11. This, uh, these are verses you ought to mark in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, he that loveth pureness of heart, pure heart, pure heart, purged heart, sanctified heart, a clean heart, he that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his leaves, the king shall be his friend. The king of kings shall be his friend. He loves purity. He hates impurity. He hates defilement. He hates sin. He hates everything that is moral dirt. And because of that, the king will be his friend. Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. And I'm reading from verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27. We're reading from verse 17. Iron sharpness iron. So a man sharpness the countenance of his friend. As you read the words of Jesus, he counsels you. He cleanses you. He sharpens your iron. Makes you brighter. Makes you excited to want to live. And makes you like you want to run. Run in the race that is set before you. We're coming to Luke chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4. Here, here are the words of Jesus. He's talking to you. If you're a friend of Jesus. Any friend of Jesus in the house today. Is talking to you. Look at this in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 4. It says, And I say unto you, my friends, I say unto you, tell me, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, they have nothing, they have no more that they can do. He's talking to his friends. And if you are his friend, look at verse 5. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two fathers? And not one of them is forgotten before God, but even the very ears of your head are all numbered. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. If he has numbered the very ears of your head, even the one you go to shave off at the barber's shop, he's counted everything, how much more your kidney, your intestine, your eyeballs, and your ear, and every part of you, you are protected. Yeah. You're secured. He says, even the very ears of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than of many sparrows. And I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denies me before men... He that denies me before men. The one that is so much afraid of sinners, afraid of persecutors, afraid of evil people. And they say, you belong to Christ. And say, no, I don't belong to Christ. Shame on you. I belong to Christ. I said, I belong to Christ. In the office, let them know by your character, by your lifestyle, by your witnessing, you know, and by everything you do, that you are a different person, that you have been converted, that you are a real child of God. You are not ashamed of Christ. In your family, let them know I belong to Christ. In your community, let them know I belong to Christ. Because it says, he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. I will not deny the Lord. We're coming to John chapter 3, John chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 29. John chapter 3, verse 29, it says, He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy Therefore, is fulfilled. Look at uh, verse 30. Here is a true friend. Here is a real friend. The friend of the bridegroom. The friend of Jesus Christ. The head of the church. He says, I'm his friend. And look at his attitude. This will be your attitude. He must increase. In your life, he will increase. All around you, he will increase. But I must 
decrease. That's the attitude and that's the language of a person that says, I'm a friend of Christ, I love Christ, and I keep the commandments of Christ. Let's come to James chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 4. James chapter 4, reading from verse 4. It tells us in James chapter 4, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? It's telling us something here. If you're a real friend of Christ, a real friend of our Savior, then you will not be a friend of the world, drinking what the world is drinking, wearing what the world is wearing, and smoking what the world is smoking. You'll be totally different. And the grace of God will be multiplied in your life. Even from today, you will be different from the world in Jesus' name. Because it says, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is sent me to with God, whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore, I have been coming to this uh, deeper life for 20 years, but are you still a friend of the world? I've been uh, coming to this church, I was, you know, at that retreat, at that conference, at this and at that, but to look at your life. What is the difference in your life? And what is the change in your life? Whosoever, whoever you are, I ever owe and the church might be it says whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God I will not be an enemy of God I said I will not be an enemy of God the question then is are you a true friend are you converted are you a true friend? Are you abiding in Christ? Are you a true friend? Are you clean by the word he has spoken to you? Are you a true friend? Are you faithful unto the Lord? Are you a true friend? Are you witnessing? Are you telling other people about this, your friend, about this, Lord Jesus Christ, who has taken hold of your life, who has cleansed you, who has converted you, who has changed you? Are you fruitful? If you say you're a friend of Christ, are you fruitful? Are you obedient to the word of the Lord? If you say you a friend of Christ, are you trustworthy? What's the privilege of the people who are real children of God? The privilege of the people who are really committed unto the Lord? What's the privilege of the people who are really uh, faithful and fruitful and friendly with the Lord? We're coming back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm going to do something here now. I'm going to read the first verse that we started with. That's verse 7. And I'm going to read verse 16. Verse 7, then verse 16. Look at this. It says in verse 7, If ye abide in me, you will abide in the Lord. And my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Did you hear that? I'm going to read that again. It says, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Yeah. Uh, look, at, look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, and that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Look at this. Look at this. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, may give it to you. He'll give it to you. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that promise of God is so important. Look at chapter 14. Uh, John chapter 14. Uh, I'm reading from verse 13. In John chapter 14 verse 13. Uh, and whatsoever, see that, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name uh, that I will do, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Look at chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 23. Chapter 16, verse 23, John 16, 23, it says, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, tell me, tell me. Say it aloud. Whatsoever, whatsoever, ye shall ask the Father in my name. He will give it to you. He'll do it for you every time in Jesus' name. Uh, look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 22. First John chapter 3 verse 22. And whatsoever, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep 
his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Look at verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by his spirit, the spirit which he has given us. Chapter 5, First John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. First John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask, tell me, if we ask, tell me out aloud. You know, if you ask for salvation, he will give salvation. And if you are asking for sanctification, he'll give sanctification. If you need healing, praise the Lord tonight. He has healed you already in Jesus' name. If you need deliverance, it is done. If you ask anything in my name, and you need whatever it is you need for yourself, for your family, for your soul, for your spirit, for your body, he answers prayer. Once we are friends of Christ, and we love Christ with all our heart and all our soul, and we prove it by the life we live. We prove it by submission to his commandment. He says in that verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, according to his will he heareth us and if we know thank god i know somebody there says thank god i know he says and if we know that he heareth us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petition that we have desired of him somebody's prayers answer tonight where is he where is she there because he says we know that our petitions are granted because we desired each of him. You are going to be a fruit. And one of the major prayers we are going to pray tonight is, so Lord, help me. I'm connected with Christ. I'm associated with Christ. I'm converted by Christ. I'm abiding in Christ. I want to be a fruit. You will be a fruit. I said you will be a fruit. And every other need in your life, the Lord will supply in Jesus' name. From tonight, the spring of joy will begin to flow in your life. And will continue to flow, to flow, to flow until joy will fill your heart, will fill your soul, will fill your personality, and will fill your family in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord is going to answer your prayer tonight. Rise up and tell the Lord is going to answer your prayer tonight. Rise up and tell the Lord is going to answer your prayer tonight. The Lord demands fruit and the Lord desires fruit. And the Lord has shown us naturally and spiritually. He wants fruit bearing in our lives. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. There's a price to pay. You must abide in the Lord. You must be saved. You must be saved. You must be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ and you must be willing, you must desire you must tell the Lord oh Lord I bring everything to the altar, I consecrate everything to the altar, purge me prepare me, purify me, do everything that is necessary, oh Lord whatever I've been withholding, whatever I've been holding back, I lay everything at the altar today, do this for me and the Lord will do it for you, he'll purge you, he'll purify you and then he'll prepare you to bring Bring more fruit unto the Lord. Fruitfulness, fruitfulness with faithfulness, with, with a fellowship, and we're totally leaning upon the Lord. And then you say, I will not draw back, I will not go back. I'm going to keep on depending on the Lord all the days of my life. And then he tells you, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. And I've chosen you purposefully. I've chosen you profitably. I've chosen you practically. I've chosen so that you will bear fruit and your fruit will abide. And whatsoever you will ask the Father in my name, he said he will do it.